every part of us that doesn't know and understand how good you are, Lord. Reveal that to us. Jesus, we love you. Lord, you are good. You are a good, good Father. Thank you, Lord God. There is none like you in all the earth. You are worthy of all praise and adoration. We worship you, God. We praise you. We praise you, Jesus.
bless your name, Lord. Hallelujah. Glory Jesus. and honor so to you. We worship Jesus. I worship you. Bless your name, Jesus. I worship you. I worship you. Forever is a long time, Lord. But it's going to be so wonderful and glorious in your presence. Forever with you is going to be so totally different from what we've known here on earth. And worshiping you will be so easy. Jesus, I love you. I glorify your name. Praise you, Lord. Bless you, Lord Jesus. Bless you, Lord Jesus. Bless you, Lord Jesus. Bless you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Lord says, the closer you get to my return, you're going to hear more and more people speaking in my name. But I say unto you, do not be quick to accept everything you hear. For many who speak truly speak by the leadership of my Holy Spirit, but sometimes they also speak out of their flesh. Then there are those who will blend what my spirit says with what they think should be said. And then some will coat their words with the name of Jesus or with the Holy Spirit or with the Father and then declare something to you that never originated with the Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit. This is why I say unto you, do not be quick to receive prophetic words until you have judged them by my words. Guard your heart for the days are short says the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Father, I thank you for your word. Your word cannot fail. Father, I just want to thank you for my salvation. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for your presence here today. And so, Father, as I've said so many times in the past, I say again, your will be done here on earth in this place and wherever people are watching exactly the way you planned it out in heaven. And Jesus, we give you the glory. We give you the praise. We glorify you this day, Jesus. We're born again because of you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. In your name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, guys, go ahead and take a few moments and get around and shake a few hands. Well, good morning. We have people out of town, wherever that is. <laughs> They're gone. They'll be back. You guys look good today. Of course, you already know that. Because you're not going to stand in the mirror and, and, and think, man, I look really bad today. <laughs> and then come to church. No, no. Thank you guys for being here today. I appreciate it. Those of you watching, thanks for joining us. We, we appreciate you joining us. And uh, anytime that we get emails, you know, there at the website, you can use the contact us form, send an email. Emails. Let me, hey, I watch the services or whatever. Hey, it's encouraging. It's always nice to hear from folks who are wherever they are. So praise the Lord, guys. Uh, it's good to be home. Hallelujah. Good to be home. Had a wonderful time out in Tulsa at the conference. Share a little bit about that here in, um, in a bit. Um,
But I do want to thank, you know, Brother Barry for covering while we were gone. You know, it's always good to go away and have peace of mind. Hallelujah. <laughs> Going to give you an opportunity to share in the offering today. Um, you know, something that I don't know. Some, there are times, how can I say this? Sometimes the Lord ministers to you, but it's not when you're, you know, on your knees and crying out to God and all that. He'll minister to you throughout the day. He brought to mind where Jesus said, the poor you'll have with you always. Now, I understand when folks talk about, you know, we've got to eliminate poverty. I under, it, hey, that's a noble cause. It really is. The problem is you're never going to do that. Never. Because you have some people, they just don't want to work. They're lazy. You've got folks who just want to live off the system, so on and so forth. And because of that, you'll never, ever get rid of poverty. Now, not everybody, no matter how hard they work, not everybody's going to become you know, a super millionaire. But, um, you know, you, you can work. Like the Bible says, if a man doesn't work, you shouldn't eat. So there's always going to be poverty to a certain extent. It's always going to be there. But God in his word also talks about those of us who are able to help. We have a responsibility to do so. When you give to this ministry, it's not simply about, you know, having air conditioning and heating and uh, the lights, keeping the lights on and replacing things that need to be replaced, etc., paying the uh, internet bill so that we have the website and the streaming costs. I mean, it's not just about all of that. But from this ministry, we help a lot of people. You know, we, um, we send money to the food bank locally. We, we had a, you know, a, um, like a food pantry here, but where we're located Hardly anybody ever came by asking for food. Well, I get it, you know. I mean, we're here in Beaver Creek, and it's just not the same as it is, you know, the inner city of Dayton. So we help the food bank, and it's our way of being a part of, you know, feeding people. Uh, we've been involved with agencies that are helping people when there are disasters. The point I'm making is this. When you give, it doesn't just stay within the four walls. It also goes out, and we are ministering to people. And I'm sharing that to encourage you so that you know we do help people. And uh, those of you watching, you know, the same thing, your offerings that come in, they're used the same way the offerings are used here uh, in many different ways, but including helping those who are facing tough times. So thank you. And on behalf of all those folks over the years that we've helped, thank you. You've made a difference in their lives. So this morning as you're giving, just be sensitive to the Lord. Whatever he would want you to give, what you would purpose in your heart. Same for those of you watching. You can send any offerings by way of PayPal or uh, the mailing address is there. And thanks. Thanks for being a part of this. So if you need an envelope, they're right there in the front. Any pew, any pews. Any checks that you make out, just make them the GCC. Same for those of you watching. Um, so everybody, go ahead and stand. I'm guessing you may be ready. Have your offerings ready. Ushers, would you please be so kind as to come forward. Praise God. Brother Barry, would you please pray over our offering today? Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just a reminder that on Friday night, November the 2nd, we will be having a bonfire, a cookout, whatever you want to call it, right in back behind the church. There will be a sign-up sheet in the rear of the sanctuary here in the next couple of weeks. Uh, 
to sign up for things to bring. And one thing I don't have on here is what time it starts. 6.30? Okay. So now I'll write 6.30. So 6.30, be here. Praise the Lord. Then another reminder that our spring conference is going to be Sunday, April 28th through Friday, May 3rd. And I know for those of us here, it's like, wow, you know, April, that's a long way off. Um, but for the folks that are watching, we have people that are watching in other countries, so they need to prepare ahead of time if they want to be here. And then the same thing for folks that live here in the States. You know, they need to prepare ahead of time if they want to be here. Um, you know, hotels aren't getting cheaper, and uh, rental cars aren't getting cheaper. It's just the way it is. So, again, mark those dates down, and we may have some new folks attending. Well, every year we do, but... There were some people that shared with me when we were just out in Tulsa, you know, they planned to be here. So praise God. Look forward to having them with us. Well, as many of you know, Kathy and I and uh, the Legos were in Tulsa this past week at a prayer and power conference. Been going out there since 1997. And, uh, you know, folks always want to know, well, how was the conference? You know, and how do you answer a question like that? You know, well, how was the conference? It was great. Okay, well, what does that mean? Well, it was great. <laughs> well, how great was it? It was so great. It really was good. And as I've been going to those conferences now for over 20 years, I've seen a shift in how God moves. Back um, in the early years, there were a lot of prayer lines, and I mean a lot of prayer lines. If you'd like prayer for, you know, whatever, you know, come on up. Man, people would come up, and in, in fact, in some cases, it, you know, if you need healing in your body, you know, come up for prayer. Well, people come up, and there'd be people coming up. They didn't want healing for their body, you know, Please, please pray for me that I get a new car. <laughs> Wait a minute. This is, you know, heal your body prayer. <laughs> this is not a car prayer line. Go sit down. No, we do. So anyway, that happened so much. But over the years, there were fewer and fewer prayer lines. And some people might think, well, you just don't care about people anymore. Well, no, that's not true. That's not true. Because over the years, so much has been taught in these conferences instructing, you know, how to receive from God on your own. In other words, it's not simply, it's not wrong to pray for people, okay? We understand that. But um, sooner or later, you have to learn how to receive on your own. Sooner or later, you have to, you know, cut the apron strings that are tying you to the preacher. Do you understand what I'm saying here in this? Because a lot of Christians... They depend on an individual more so than God. Well, if I can just get in that prayer line, have so-and-so pray for me, then I'll get whatever it would be. Well, I appreciate whatever anointing a preacher operates by and so forth. But when your trust is in the preacher more than in God, you're going to be very, very disappointed. And I know this year, <laughs> it's kind of funny, there were a couple of services <laughs> where one person was preaching, then at the end of the service, the person said, okay, you know, prayer line for something. And then called me up to do the praying. <laughs> it's like, okay, whatever. <laughs> so I'm praying for people. And I kid you not, there were people in the prayer line. I, I would ask them, is there anything that you'd like me to pray with you about? No, nothing, nothing really, just whatever. <laughs> Oh, God, uh, God, please give them common sense. <laughs> no, I didn't pray like that. <laughs> but it happened, you know, and, and people would come up for prayer for something totally unrelated. But the prayer lines weren't as long. Well, that's not a bad thing. 
and there's always a willingness to pray for people. But as the years have continued to progress, there has been, I guess, one way to put it would be maybe four years ago, five, there was kind of a, a shift in the direction of personal accountability. And over the years, the last few years, that has increased a lot to the point this most recent conference, it was very much on personal accountability. Uh, the sermon that I preached, it's already available at our website. They provided us with a video that we may be able to get uploaded to our website so folks can watch uh, that particular service. But what's happening is, um, do you remember, well, some of you may, several years ago, there was a prophecy that came forth here. And just to summarize, it was talking about, you know, there's coming a civil war in the body of Christ. Remember that? Now, this was maybe, I don't know, eight, nine years ago, ten years ago. Well, <laughs> the lines of demarcation, as they say, are becoming more and more pronounced. And there's a lot of conflict in the body of Christ that has nothing to do with personalities. But it has everything to do with doctrine and where we stand in our walk with God. Go ahead and turn over. We'll start in Ephesians chapter 5. What I'm going to be sharing with you this morning is um, kind of a, a way to let you know the theme that was kind of flowing through the services at the conference. Another way to say it would be this is kind of like a post-conference message that ties into the conference itself. And you'll, you'll really understand if you not just listen to this, but go back and uh, listen to the services at uh, Dave Roberson Ministries website, you'll be able to download the audio and so forth. Well, anyway, in Ephesians chapter 5, look at verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Now, the first part of this, you know, the husbands love your wives, okay, that's, that's not the part we're focusing on. We're, we're focusing on the fact that through Jesus Christ, we who have put our faith in him, we're born again, we're part of, you know, the church, his body. And it talks here about a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Okay, what does that mean to you? I want you to think about this. What does that mean to you? Holy, without blemish, having no spot. You know, I mean, what does that mean to you? Have you, have you ever really thought about it? Most people define that by how they want to live. So when it comes to not having spot or wrinkle or blemish and being holy, this is all according to what God says, not what we think. So what does that mean to you? If you're a part of the church, if you're born again, if you've accepted Jesus Christ <coughs> as your Lord and Savior, what does that mean to you? And does that describe you? Would you fit into that verse? Now look over in 1 Peter. 1 Peter, it was interesting, you know, I'm back there in my office this morning and he just kept adding verses to this. And I mean, I, you know, I'm ready to come out here and worship. I said, no, nope, here's another one. Nope, here's another one. Well, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15 
But as he which have called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. That word conversation is not simply what you say, but it's your lifestyle, how you live. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. All right, now look at these verses. What does this mean to you? What? I'm not asking for everybody to give their own personal interpretation. What I'm asking is the reality of this. Does it mean anything? I mean, does this really have an impact? Are you really accepting what he's saying here? See, this is coming from God. It's not coming from a denomination or a group or, a, you know, whoever. This is coming from God. And he's saying in verse 15, you know, God is the one who's called you into salvation. He's the one who saved you. And he is holy. He is holy. Therefore, you be holy in every area of your life. Do you realize this represents a choice? This, listen, the moment you got born again, it says over in Ephesians chapter 4, it tells us, tells us that when we were born again, we were created, that born again life in us was created out of God's own righteousness and true holiness. Now that's who you are. That's the real you, the born again you. That's you. But yet, you still have a choice to live according to that holiness and righteousness. It's totally up to you. God won't make you do it. God is not going to force this. Just If he was going to force anything, he would have forced Adam to stay away from the fruit. But he didn't do it. And Adam, he had the holy life of God on the inside of him. And look how things went. <laughs> He made a wrong choice. Now here God is saying, look, you're holy. You be holy. If this was impossible, be ye holy for I am holy. If this was impossible, if it couldn't be done by a Christian, these words would not be in here. He wouldn't tell you to do it. He's never going to tell you to do something you can't. And so when he says, look, I am holy, so you be holy in every area of your life. Does that mean anything at all to you? To kind of jump ahead in this message, you need to understand that the body of Christ in general has been led into a sense of complacency in their walk with God. And we accommodate in our lives a lot of junk that we shouldn't. I know not every, every Christian does this, but in general, this goes on. And when you start saying things like, you know, be holy in your lifestyle, you might as well be prepared for Christians, you know, to roll up their sleeves and put them up. And who are you to judge me? You know what? I'll judge every human being on earth. And God has ordained me to do it. You say, Brother Martin, you're a false prophet. No, 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 I'm not. I take the word of God. If God says murder is a sin, then I can look at you and say, you know that person you just murdered? Okay, you committed sin. Who are you to judge me, bless God? <laughs> God's all, I'm just repeating to you what God said. The judgment isn't coming from my point of origin. The judgment's coming from what God has said in his word. And every single Christian, listen to me, every single Christian is qualified to judge from that perspective. If that weren't true, why in the world would he say, if you see a brother who's committed a fault, intervene? Why would he say that? Why would he say, if your brother trespasses against you, go to him and, and try to help this thing get worked out? If I'm not supposed to judge anybody, then I just let it go. And... and Nothing gets dealt with. As Christians, we have a responsibility to address these things. And pastors, one of the reasons pastors, one of the reasons pastors don't do this is because they want to try and keep peace in the church. Because I'm telling you right now, when you have people in the church 
who aren't living holy in their conversation and it gets addressed, you better be ready. You had just, I'm leaving and taking my money with me. <laughs> okay. Purge out the leaven. That is an instruction from God through the Apostle Paul. If you've got people in your church who refuse to repent, refuse to make things right, insist on continuing to live in sin, show them the door and help them out. Purge the leaven. Don't you know a little leaven? Leaven at the whole lump? Paul was addressing sin in the church. And he was doing it by instruction from God. Now look over in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Now you do realize that when Jesus was here on earth, more than once, he confronted religious leaders over their error, wrong doctrine, and misinterpretation of the law, and misapplication of the law. But when he taught, he was not teaching the law. He was teaching the principles of the kingdom. It's, what this, it, it, it's in Scripture. This whole, what people refer to as a Sermon on the Mount, that wasn't a lesson on the law. That was a lesson on Here's what's coming when, I completed my, when I've completed my work here on earth. Here's the way it's going to be in the kingdom. Now he says, uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 14. Look at this. Now these are Jesus' words. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Well, that's rather interesting. But now look over in Mar or, or, uh, Mark. Yeah, Mark chapter 11. In Mark chapter 11, verse 25, Jesus said, And when you stand praying, forgive if you have aught against any, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. But if ye do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. Now, these two passages we've just read, what does that mean to you? Jesus wasn't stuttering. <laughs> what does this mean to you? And some people would say, well, yeah, but he was talking to people under the law. Oh, okay. So that means that now that we're no longer under the law, I don't have to forgive and God's okay with it. Seriously? Is that what you're telling me? Where do you come from in this? Not you, but the people that preach this. <laughs> This said, okay, these are the kind of things Christians don't want to talk about, don't want to think about, don't want to hear preached about because they don't want to believe it's true. But how are you going to get around it? Jesus said, Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds forth out of the mouth of God. Jesus said, my words are spirit and they are life. Now, two times he said, if you don't forgive, you will not be forgiven. Now, I ask you something. Why wouldn't you forgive? Well, people can come up with all kinds of reasons. You don't know what they did. You don't know how they treated me. You don't know this. You don't know that. Okay, great. I don't know these things. But why wouldn't you want to forgive? Look over in 1 John. 1 John chapter 2. And in 1 John chapter 2, just begin reading in verse 9. He that saith he is in the light. Now stop right there. What's he talking about? Well, it's kind of King james but what he's talking about, he that says that he is walking in the light of his salvation or in the light of holiness or in the light of the life of God or in the light of his born-again life. I mean, different ways you can say this. But he that saith that he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. So you may think that you're walking in light, but he says, no, look, if you hate, you're walking in darkness. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness 
and walketh in darkness and knoweth not whither he goeth because that, now look at this, that darkness hath blinded his eyes. Now this word hate, it's not simply, uh, you, you can't simply define it as I hate you and if I could I would kill you. All right, well, that could be part of it. But why do you hate this person? See, not getting into all different you know, Greek words and so forth, but this is connected to that whole thing of if you don't forgive, well, why wouldn't you want to forgive? Why do you hate? And he says right here that the blindness, the darkness has blinded your eyes. So ultimately, if you're walking in unforgiveness, you're walking in darkness, God considers it hatred, you say, well, why would God consider it hatred? Because God so loved the world, he was willing to forgive us for anything and everything. And we're supposed to be the same. That's a part of holiness. And so he says, look, your eyes are blinded because of this darkness. What does that mean? That means you can't see what's really going on in your life. Well, I'll forgive if they apologize. No, that's not what it says. You're blind. You're blind. Now look over in chapter 3, 1 John chapter 3. And look here in verse 15. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Okay. Do you see this? Do you see what he's saying here? Is this really sinking in? He's, this is, First John was written to Christians. There are some people that say, no, the first chapter of 1 John was written to the lost, and chapters 2 on were written to... No, 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 absolutely not. Many of you have a copy of where I took the entire book of 1 John, left it word for word, but eliminated the chapter breaks, eliminated the verse numbers, and turned it into a letter, like you would send to a friend. When you have it in context, it is impossible, absolutely impossible, to say that chapter 1 was written to the lost. Impossible. And anybody who buys into that is blinded, and they've been deceived by a false prophet. Now, he says right here, whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Do you see what he's saying? Do you see? He's saying, okay, here's imagery. At one time, everything was okay between you, God, and the whole world, but something's happened, and you got upset, got mad. You refused to forgive. God defines it as hating, and he also says, in my, pers my vision, from my perspective, as I sit here on the throne, that's the same thing as murder. Now, we don't understand that. But from his perspective, that's what he calls it. Now, we can say, I don't want to believe this. We can say, I don't want to accept this. We can say, well, that's just a little too harsh, Brother Martin. Go ahead and say that. But you're not going to change what God has declared. And he says, if this is you, you may think you're walking in the light, and that everything is okay. But any murderer does not have eternal life in him. You're going to hell. Well, that's pretty strong language, Brother Martin. Well, if you don't have eternal life, what do you have? <laughs> Where do you think you're headed? See, for years, there was... <laughs> You get into some churches and groups and all, and you would hear holiness preached as, you know, what's in your closet? <laughs> you know, what kind of makeup are you wearing? Because you're not supposed to have any on. Women, don't you cut your hair. Men don't wear this. No jewelry. And I mean, just all kinds of things. All right. That's not holiness the way scripture defines it. You understand this? It's talking about God's life dominating every aspect of your character, your nature, what you do. Now, he tells you right here, if you don't love or if you hate your brother, then you do not have 
eternal life abiding in you. And Christians don't want to hear this. And I'm telling you right now, my experience with a lot of Christians is this. They're going to hell. Because they're refusing to forgive and there's anger and venom in their voice when they talk about certain people. Hey, this is the word of God. See, when God says be holy, because I'm holy, that holiness says I forgive. See, before you got born again, do you realize you were forgiven? Do you understand that? And Jesus Christ was the avenue through which to receive that forgiveness and eternal life. If God wasn't willing to forgive you, he'd have never sent Jesus. But he sent Jesus. He says, I'm willing to forgive. The forgiveness, the love, it's already in me. Just come to the cross and receive it. Just accept my son Jesus Christ and experience this. What, what is this saying to you? I mean, do you really capture the magnitude of the warning that he's giving? And I already know a lot of Christians, they would rebel against this. Again, because I don't want to hear that. And really, what it comes down to is, I don't want to be accountable to anybody other than me and what I determine is right or wrong. That's not going to cut it. Look over here in, um, look at 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Now again, this book was, this was written to Christians. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, He says, look here in verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous, unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now he says... In verse 11, and such were some of you, but you are washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Okay, praise God for verse 11. However, do you see what he says in verses 9 and 10? Do you see this? That means if you make a decision, even if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and even if you have been, you know, filled the Holy Ghost, et cetera, and so on, if you make a decision to live these things, verses 9 and 10, if that is your decision, we're not talking about a wrong choice one night. If you make a decision for these things to be incorporated into your lifestyle, guess what? He says you'll not inherit the kingdom of God. It won't happen. Now, you, if you want to keep your finger here, we might come right back to it in a moment, but over in Galatians chapter 5, Something very similar. Again, this is written to, to believers. And he says in verse 19, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, uh, drunkenness, revelings, and su such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past that they which do, that phrase which do means incorporate into a lifestyle or live this way. They which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now between Galatians chapter 5, what we just read here, and what's over in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, this covers every form of sexual activity outside the husband and wife relationship. It just, it's, it's porn, it's everything. It covers it. It covers drug use, getting high. It covers drunkenness. Well, you know what that's about. I mean, it, it, this, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, where it's talking about, you know, like extortioners and so forth, I, if I had gone through and brought out all the, the Greek words, we'd be here for who knows how long going through all this, all right? But part of what this is talking about, extortioners and the covetous, it's talking about a person in business who does whatever is necessary for profit. Meaning, they'll tell you, hey, this car is in perfect condition. 
listen, it was a little old lady. Why, she just drove it to church and the grocery store. Now I realize it's eight years old, but that mileage is for real. It's only got 32,000 miles. Well, what they didn't tell you is that they ran the odometer back. And not only that, but if you take the uh, covers off the like rear tail lights and you see sand and silt in there, it means that car was pulled up out of a lake, out of a flood. And all they've done is bought it, shined it up, and lied to you. Now, that's just one example. Christians do this. I've encountered Christians who lie, who cheat, and do everything in the name of money. Now, he's saying if that is your lifestyle. Now, see, we think, well, that's not that big of a deal. I mean, a lot of people do that, but that's just, okay, but that's, listen, when you got born again, you were born again with the life and the nature and the character of God. That is your born again spirit. You'll never be deity, but his life, nature, and character is what brought you into existence as a born again person. Lying to people for profit is not in the nature and the character of God. It's not holy, but honesty is a part of holiness. That, see, this is where so many Christians have a hard time with this stuff because we don't see some of these things as being so bad. But if God says, if this is how you live, <laughs> you're not going to inherit the kingdom. Well, again, Brother Martin, I think you're being just a little bit harsh. I'm sorry if you think that way, but I'm not sorry if you think that way <laughs> because this is the word of God. This is the word of God. You talk about, we read there in um, 1 Corinthians about, you know, the washing of the water by the word. You say, well, what? Yeah, what does that mean? I'm not clear on that. Okay, here's a way to understand that. Here's the word. The word says, don't steal, don't lie. None of that stuff outside the, the boundaries of marriage and blah, blah, and et cetera. Okay. Now I have the word, and I compare the word to my lifestyle. It's like, oops. <laughs> and now I purge myself. I don't, really, I don't even need the word because I have a conscience. In Hebrews chapter 10. And here in just a few moments, I'm going to share some things with you that the Lord spoke to me while we were at the conference. In Hebrews chapter 10. Now, we don't have time to go through this whole chapter, okay? But in verse 26. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. How much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite under the Spirit of grace. Oh, he's talking to Christians. Well, how in the world do you trample underfoot and how do you, you know, despite and all? Because when you make a decision to incorporate those other things into your life and that's how you live, then what you're saying, I don't need the blood. I'm good enough without it, and I can do these things, and I'll still be accepted. And he says in verse 35, Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of, a war, of reward. Okay, briefly, very briefly. When I start living those things that we just identified, I'm casting away my confidence in my relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, that's not the sum total of everything that's said here, but verse 36 <coughs> For you have need of patience that after you have done the will of God that you might receive the promise. What is the promise? Well, it can be the promise of being born again because I've already received that. What is the will of God? Be holy as he is holy. Again, we're having to kind of concise this. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe unto the saving of the soul. What's this talking about, this draw back stuff? 
This drawback is talking about somebody who had been washed in the blood of Jesus, had come to the full understanding, the knowledge of the truth, etc., and so forth, but they began drawing back or removing themselves from what they had in that relationship with Jesus Christ. And he says that they are, verse 39, drawing back unto perdition. This word perdition, it's the Greek word apolia, and what it means is uh, to destroy fully the state of death meaning, you know, physical death, we're in exclusion from eternal salvation and the presence of God is a fact. So here I am, born again, but I begin doing this stuff and I'm drawing back, drawing back, draw, and eventually I draw myself back to that place of perdition. When I was growing up, man, I was told these things can't happen. But it's here in the Word. We ignored these passages. We didn't bring these things out. Look over in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And look here in verse 10. Now again, written to believers. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive, may receive judgment according to the things done in his body, according to what he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Okay, now think about this. These folks out there that say, well, you know what? You're born again, right? Yeah, I'm born again. Okay, well, you know, you don't have to repent for anything. I mean, it doesn't matter what you do. Well, if that's the case, why do I have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ for any kind of judgment? If it doesn't matter, <laughs> why, do I ha why do this? And then I'm going to be judged if I did some bad things? Well, no, wait, I didn't, think, I didn't think it mattered before God. Well, apparently it does matter. But see, again, you know, I don't want to hear this because I don't want to be confronted with personal accountability. I want to be able to do whatever I want. <laughs> How many of you remember all of the rhetoric that went on after Brett Kavanaugh was nominated to be a Supreme Court justice? Remember that? Well, yeah, Brother Martin, <laughs> I definitely remember that. All right, listen to what the Lord shared. It was Sunday morning during the 8.30 service at the conference. Here's what he said. Many are more concerned, and uh, you have to listen to how this was said. Listen to the word. Many are more concerned about the moral history of a Supreme Court justice than they are the moral lifestyle of the leadership in their church. You got people in churches don't care. You got people in churches, stuff's going on, and it doesn't really matter. Why not? If I go to a church and I found out my pastor's been doing a bunch of fooling around, and he says, well, I'm going to take a month, month off for restoration. Dude, you need more than a month. You've been standing up there from that pulpit preaching the word of God to me, and now I find out you've been preaching on Sundays and, and fooling around on the weekends. And you say you only need a month? I don't think so. You need a whole lot longer than a month to get this worked out between you and God. Then you need to stand up and teach us why you failed. You're the pastor. You're the shepherd. Let us know why you gave in and teach us how to avoid it. And yet you've got more Christians. This Man, I'm telling you what. That stuff was on Facebook about his nomination from believers. I mean, all, it's like, you guys, man, you're missing it. This isn't about ignoring. You know, I shared with you here the other day. You want to go back 40 years in my life? Well, I'm disqualified to stand here today. I'm totally disqualified. I give you a list of preachers who are totally disqualified to deliver the word of God because of what they did 30, 35, 40 years ago. It's ridiculous what's going on. But when sin is confronted, it rears its head and says, I want to fight. I will not submit to the word of God. Here's something else he said to me. You don't have to understand the why to do the what. You don't have to understand the what. In other words, well, what does that mean, Brother Martin? What it means is this. If God says, do not commit fornication then okay 
I don't have to go to him and say, but why not? I mean, come on, it's fun. I like it. I'm a really good fornicator. You know, come on. <laughs> I have perfected the art of fornication. Now you're telling me to stop? I don't get it. God says it doesn't matter. If I say don't do it, I must be telling you something for your good because I'm working in you to will and to do of my good pleasure, which is to be your good pleasure. So therefore, if I say don't do it, don't do it. You don't need to know the why to do the what. Well, okay, I don't understand it, but he said don't, so therefore I won't. It's that simple. Look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Verse 13, for if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Another way to say this is, if you make a decision, I mean, relative to believers now, if you make a decision to live according to those things in 1 Corinthians 6 and Galatians 5, you're going to die. You're going to separate yourself from God. But if you make a decision to be holy according to the holiness that God put in you when you were born again. And through the power of that holiness, you say no to every form of sin. You mortify the deeds of the body. Then you're going to live and spend eternity with God. Now, that's a big paraphrase and amplification here, but this is what he's saying. Here's something... With this in mind, here's something, the, another thing the Lord said with me, said to me. He said, too many of my children are mortifying my will instead of their flesh. What is his will? Be holy. I don't want to be holy. And ain't no preacher going to tell me what to do. Okay, well, what about the Bible? Well, you, you just can't understand everything in the Bible. Well, what about the ministry of the Holy Spirit? You know, teach you all things, guide you into all truth. Well, I'm a work in progress. <laughs> what does that mean? When you got born again, you were holy. There, what, you, you don't work into your holiness. You might live according to it. What are you saying to me? Now, you just don't want to be accountable. I, listen. There are people I know, personally, who have professed Jesus. But they have incorporated 1 Corinthians 6, Galatians 5 things into their lifestyle. If they don't repent and make it right, they're going to hell. Brother Martin, you're just too strict. Take it up with God. I'm just telling you what he says in his word. This is, see, this is the problem. Over the years, okay, the apostles understood this. And that is why they put it in their writings. That's why they passed it along. They knew these things. But over the years, the body of Christ has watered all this down so that holiness becomes what I define it for me and what you define it for you. Well, it may be okay for you, but it's not okay for me. But if God says it's not okay for anybody, then guess what? It's not okay for anybody. Don't do it. Just don't do it. You know, this whole thing of the holiness, during uh, one of the services, um, one of the preachers was talking about how that he had been having a conversation with somebody in his church who eventually just decided, I don't want to hear this stuff anymore, and left, left the church. Talking about, you know, you can't just keep living and doing certain things. You know, you've you got to repent. You've got to make it right. And uh, then this person was trying to twist it all back on the pastor. Well, you know, all kinds of things are sin. You know, if I run a stop sign, you know, well, that's a sin. And when he said that, the Lord began ministering to me about that concept. See, it's possible to run a stop sign and not do it on purpose. And here's the illustration that I gave. If a tree grows and becomes very big at a corner, at a, you know, right there next to a sign, the tree and branches can grow out and cover the stop sign and you don't even see it. And so you just drive right through the intersection. Now, did you run a stop sign? Yeah. Could you be given a ticket? Absolutely. But you didn't know it was there. If you had known, you'd have stopped. You ran the stop sign by accident. However, it is impossible 
to accidentally commit fornication. <laughs> it is impossible to accidentally commit adultery. It is impossible to accidentally get drunk. It is impossible to accidentally, you know, get high on drugs. Do you understand what I'm saying? I mean, this list could go on. There are some things that aren't accidents. <laughs> it's what you do. So you can't throw this, well, running a stop sign. And some, you, you could be given a ticket for speeding and didn't even know you were speeding because the speed limit sign got knocked over. But you were still speeding. Well, how, did, how were you supposed to know? There have been times I've been out driving, and I'm driving, driving, I'm looking at my speedometer, and I can't remember ever seeing a speed limit sign. So I don't know if I'm doing right or wrong. But when it comes to some of this stuff, you know, these things, 1 Corinthians 6, Galatians 5, okay, these aren't accidents. These aren't, oops, <laughs> whoa, look at that. <laughs> I was dressed a moment ago. Where'd my clothes go? <laughs> and look at you. Whoa, look at you. <laughs> yeah. How'd this happen? No, it doesn't work that way. And God knows it. The things that he's put in his word saying, okay, don't do these things. These are things that we can avoid doing by the power of who we become in Jesus Christ. Look over in Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24. In verse 3, it says that Jesus sat upon the Mount of Olives. His disciples came unto him privately saying, Tell us when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? So they're asking him a question that goes beyond their lifetime and looks like it may be our lifetime. In other words, they're asking him a question that's going to be answered, and the answer is going to be pertinent to events like 2,000 years after the fact. And Jesus answered and said unto them, now look here. He says, take heed that no man deceive you. Now what did they ask? You know, the sign of your return, the sign of the end of the world. He says, okay, I'll tell you. Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. In other words, he's not saying, you're going to have all these people show up and tell you, I'm Jesus, I'm Christ. Well, some people have done that. But it's talking about people saying, I am sent from God. Here's the sermon. Here's the prophecy. Here's the, the, in other words, that they are of Christ. And then if you look down here in verse 11, and many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Well, granted, you can have some very strange people out there in the world that are very deceptive, but he's speaking about the body of Christ, if you leave this in context. Now, when it comes to this whole thing, you know, the signs of Jesus' return and the signs of the end of the world and so forth, you know, well, I want to know about the nation shall rise against nation. Yeah, well, you need to focus first and foremost on being sure that no man deceives you. Yeah, but I want to hear about the earthquakes and I want to hear about the famines. Yeah, okay, but the first thing you need to focus on is being sure that nobody deceives you, that you're not led astray by the false prophets. Well, yeah, but I want to hear about the wars and the rumors of wars, and I want to hear about... And Jesus, the very first thing he said was, take heed that no man deceive you. And he talks about false, false prophets, and he does it again in verse 24. The first thing, the first thing, the very, in any end time prophecy, you know, I'm going to teach you over the next five days what's going to happen in the end and blah, blah, blah. The very first thing that needs to be taught is how to guard against deception. But they jump right into the wars and the rumors of wars, the mark of the beast and the, you know, the Antichrist and the European global unification, blah, blah, new Roman Empire. I mean, all the, they get into all that stuff. It's like, okay, great. It's all interesting. However, I'm still deceivable. <laughs> How do I avoid being deceived? Because if you continue reading and you study this out and leave it in context, what he's saying is this deception is going to lead some people completely away from their relationship with Jesus Christ. That whole thing of being of drawing back into perdition. And he's saying, take heed that no man deceive you. The first thing I need to know concerning end time prophecy is how do I avoid deception? 
But now look, over in chapter 25, he's continuing all this teaching. (coughs) In chapter 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him. Now, does this sound like he's still teaching about end time events? Absolutely. Then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another. Now, when it says all nations, he's not talking about, I'm going to separate Russia from China, and I'm going to sit, no, the, the people groups, all, all humans, if you will. And he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Now, you understand He's not talking about having a bunch of farmers stand before him with their animals, all right? You understand he's, he's using, you know, illustrations here, all right, imagery. The sheep are those who are born again, the sheep of his pasture. The goats are those who aren't born again. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you, from the foundation of the world. Now, what did we read in 1 Corinthians 6 and Galatians chapter 5? That people who incorporate those things listed into their lifestyle shall not inherit the kingdom, right? And so he says, you know, those of you on my right, the sheep, you know, come, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world, for I was hungry. And you gave, now stop right there. Before we go any further, he's not simply talking about hunger, thirst, and, uh, you know, strangers taking them in. No. Again, this is an illustration, and I don't have time to break each of these down, but he's talking about fulfilling the will of God here on the earth. Meaning, you know, what, was the, what do we see Jesus do? Well, part of what he did was declare the kingdom and preach the gospel of the kingdom. Well, he says here, for I was hungry and you gave me meat. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, When saw we thee hungry, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee to drink? When, we saw, thee, uh, when saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, the everlasting fire is not supposed to be a place where humans go. You understand this? It was prepared for the devil and demons and so on and so forth. But when you reject Jesus Christ, this is where you go. And he says to those on his left, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire. He says, For I was hungry, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger. You took me not in naked, and you clothed me not sick and in prison, and you visited me not. Then, now look at this, then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee hungry, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as you did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Okay, now, I've got to keep this really short. What he's teaching here, and what we refer to as, um, what, what, the Mount Olivet Discourse, I think is what it's called. Anyway, this whole, all this stuff he's talking about here, Matthew 24, 25, and all. He is speaking to the church prophetically. What's the sign of your return? What's the sign of the end of the world? Okay, I'll tell you. Take heed that no man deceive you. If you're lost, you're already deceived. You don't know, you've rejected Jesus Christ. Take heed that no man deceive you. So he immediately is saying, I am speaking prophetically to my church. Now, verses 31 through 46 Jesus said this roughly 2,000 years ago. That means we've had it in print now for centuries. Not from the moment he said it, I know that, but we've had this in print for centuries. 
okay, he spoke about 2,000 years ago concerning what is coming relative to this judgment. And those of us who have a Bible, Christians now, who have read this, heard it preached, heard it read, do we not know what is coming? Right? Therefore, on this day, when we stand before him, if he separates any of us to his left, do we not already know what is coming? These people act like they're clueless. These people are saying, what are you talking about? What, what, what are you blaming me for? What did I do wrong? How, how, how can you say this? It's like, wait a minute. You knew what to do because you have my life and nature on the inside of you and you seared your conscience to the point to where you drew back unto perdition. These people act like they're surprised. I'm going to show you a variation on this same theme. Look over in Matthew chapter 7, in verse 21. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Again, we're having to keep this, you know, jump in here without doing the whole chapter. He says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. When you do his, first, first and foremost... What is doing his will? It's number one, believing on Jesus. Not simply to be born again, but believing what he said. Accepting his words. And he says, doing the will of my Father. Be ye holy as I am holy. See, you don't have to open blind eyes or cause the lame to walk or raise the dead or walk on water or turn water into wine. You don't have to do any of those things. Just be holy. This is where it starts. Be holy as I am holy. That is like a foundational aspect of the will of God. And he says, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day. What day? The day they stand before him in judgment. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not what? Prophesied in thy name and in thy name cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Well, that's what he was telling those folks, the goats, the people on the left. This is the same bunch. And he says, look, okay, you, you prophesied in my name. You, you cast out devils. All right, but, but, he says, I never knew you. Now, now, some people would say, well, that means that they were never born again in the first place. No, that word knew is the Greek word genosko. And the image that it paints is somebody who knows what the other person wants. An, an intimate knowledge and relationship with that other person knows what that person wants and does it and lives that way and honors and respects that other person. Do you understand what I'm saying here? In other words, just because I say I'm born again, just because at one time I was being used of God, cast out devils, etc., and so forth, but if I stand up and begin justifying sin. I don't really know him. There's no intimacy in this relationship. I am denying the very Lord who saved me. Now, in verse 24, or, or Matthew chapter 24, when he talks about, beware lest any man deceive you, and he talks about these false prophets and so forth. False prophets, now listen to this, based on everything we've seen so far in Scripture, and there's a whole lot more we could include, guys, a whole lot more. But based on just on what we've seen in Scripture today, false prophets include all those who preach and teach, but they do not emphasize repentance and scriptural holy living. Not denominational holy living or personal holy living or whatever, but what God has said in his word. People who do not emphasize this. You don't have to stand up and scream, yell, shout, run to pews and all this other to emphasize it. You just, here's the word of God. Here's what God said, now do it. In fact, <laughs> you can be your own false prophet. 
just convince yourself it doesn't matter. Just accept the words of a false prophet, make them your own, and live that way. You become your own false prophet. You know, too many Christians are not accepting this. Now, let's bring this home to us. Those of you here, those of you watching, those of you listening. What we read over there in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and Galatians chapter 5, I don't care how old you are, 10, 12, 110, 112, If you're incorporating these kind of things in your lifestyle, you're going to hell. Do you hear me? You're going to hell. And I don't care. You say, Brother Martin, that's harsh talk. Glory to God. What did we just read from God himself? What's in the word? This goes back to where Christians, they don't want to be accountable. How dare you tell me I'm going to hell? Um... You know, I knelt before the altar, and okay, you know what? I've heard all these stories. What is your lifestyle now? Not what was it 15 years ago. What is your lifestyle now? How are you living? What are you doing? I know of a, 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 a minister who was talking to a family member of his who was living in sin. I mean, the guy was living with his girlfriend. And he said, you can't keep doing this. I mean, this was somebody who professed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I mean, the whole nine yards. And, and this, the preacher told him, he said, you can't keep doing this. You're going to hell. And the guy said, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. It's like, what? Here's the thing. He doesn't know. Burning for eternity with no hope of escape if that becomes a reality in your consciousness, you're going to want normal people, semi-normal people, <laughs> abnormal people are going to want to do something about it to avoid that. Why would you choose something like that? You can't live this way. You can't. And if you, if you hear today, you may say, well, you know, but I, you know, I'm only 14 years old. And uh, no, no, no. You, you are, right now, the very fact that you're saying that, you're telling me you know. You know. Well, I'm only 14. And, you know, God, God wouldn't let me go to hell. Yeah, he will. Because it's your choice. He's not great. People, why would a loving God send people to hell? No, you got it all wrong, man. You're already going to hell. The moment you got born, you were born with a lost nature. You're on your way to hell. God pro provided Jesus Christ to help you avoid that place. He, that's why he is a loving God. He provided Jesus Christ a way for you to escape going to hell. But if you reject Jesus Christ, guess what? That's your destiny. And if you've got this stuff going on in your life, and here's the thing, you don't need me to go through and define all the Greek words. That conscience, that born-again life conscience on the inside of you, unless you've seared it, you know. You know. And I'm, t I, you know, <laughs> Christians that think that they can be involved intimately with somebody they're not married to, and that when the Lord comes back, everything's going to be okay, they're just going to go with him. Like, seriously? Seriously. You're with this person, and you're, you're together. Your place, his place, whatever. Your clothes aren't on. And you are smack dab in the middle. Joined together. And you think you're going with him? What's he going to do? Pull you apart? And take you? Well, you know, she's not lost, but I, or she's lost, but I'm born again, so he'll take me. And leave her. God have mercy. Do you really believe that? See, this whole concept of God's holiness, not man's holiness, but God's holiness, is generally lost on the body of Christ. And me, you, all of you watching, listening, 
we've got to take this seriously. God's not joking around. If you've got this stuff going on in your life, guys, you need to repent. You need to make it right. And see, the power of God's life on the inside of you is the power to say no to every temptation. There's no such thing as, well, I just couldn't help myself. No, you lean in the direction of, you know, the flesh more than your born-again spirit. It was a choice. Well, it, it overpowered me. Wait a minute. God makes it very clear in Scripture. You will never face a temptation that is more powerful than you. That's, that's in the Word. Unforgiveness. You hold on to anything against somebody? Remember what we read earlier? You have to let it go. Don't you tell me what to do. God already said. I mean, I can't make you, and neither can God, but I'm telling you what he says. You've got to let it go. Forgive. Walk in love. It's just too hard. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's up to you. Remember what Jesus warned about? How that in, in many cases, our worst enemies will be those of our own household. <laughs> Some of you in here can bear witness to that. Forgive them and let it go. Well, the devil, he doesn't want you to. Your emotions don't want you to. But here's the thing. God expects us to be pure, spotless, and holy before him. That's the standard he's looking for. And look, here's every one of us in this room, we probably have a friend, loved one, family member who's living 1 Corinthians 6 or Galatians 5. All we can do is pray. Our prayers will not change their will. And we're, we will stand in faith believing they are going to come back to God. But the truth of the matter is, if they don't, they're going to hell. How dare you say, this is the word of God, not mine. That's why we can't keep we cannot keep from praying. Can't stop praying. We, we have to continue to pray. You know, Father, send laborers into the harvest field of their life. They don't want to listen to me. But there's somebody out there they will listen to. Father, guide and direct. Work it out that they be restored. You know, some people out there that they'll play the restoration game. They're living out there, 1 Corinthians 6, Galatians 5 stuff. Then they come back in church. Man, they got their hands raised, worshiping. They don't know what to do. They, they, they know what to say. But then they go out and they just start living that stuff all over again. According to the word of God, they do not have eternal life abiding in them. Is there hope? Absolutely there's hope. But the one thing you don't want is for them to end up so hardened they're not going to receive anything the Lord's trying to do in their life. Praise God. You say, Brother Martin, I, this is kind of a sobering message. Well, yeah, but these verses that we read, man, those are sobering. And I'm just telling you, guard your heart. Don't say yes. Don't yield to this stuff. Use God's word as the standard for what is and is not sin. Don't create sin. You know, don't, don't, you know, define something as being a sin when it's really not. Use God's word as your standard. And that conscience on the inside of you, listen. The voice of God, listen. And if there's anything you need to repent of, anything you need to make right, you need to do it. And be ready because Jesus is coming back. Praise God. Well, please stand. Father, I pray for me, for every person here, every person listening to this sermon, every person watching, that, Father, there would be an increased level of conviction in our lives if we start leaning in the direction, even thinking 
of doing things that you've decide, d- defined as sin. You're not a God of condemnation. But Father, there is such a thing as, as a conviction. Call it an inner warning, Father, however we would, would think of it. But work that in us, Father. And I pray that if there are those here today, hearing, watching, whatever, that there needs to be repentance, that, Father, they'd repent, that they'd make it right between you and them, because ultimately they answer to you. And that, Father, as you said in your word, if we confess, then the blood of Jesus cleanses us. And, Father, you do not hold it against us ever. You cast it away. You don't recall it. And I thank you for this. And Father, help us to understand more clearly how to pray for our friends and loved ones who just aren't living the way that you defined as as holiness. And Father, help us understand that living a holy life is not restrictive. It's actually liberating. So, Father, I thank you for this. I thank you for it. And, Father, my confession, I guess you could say, is that the people who are part of this ministry, either in person or by way of the Internet, that we live according to your holiness. Not man's definition, but your holiness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, if you're here today and you've never really made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, you need to think hard about this. Because all these things that I shared with you, it's real. Those of you watching, the same thing. I don't know where you are. I don't know what's going on in your life. But if you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that. Those of you watching, same for you. I'm going to lead in a prayer this is a prayer to be born again so if this is what you want if you want your life to be changed if you want to be what God desires then repeat this prayer after me there are folks here who are born again they're going to pray along as an encouragement for you but just repeat this after me dear Lord Jesus there is sin in my life and I cannot change myself You're the only one who can help me. So I ask you for that help now. I invite you into my life. Please remove the old sin nature and give to me the born again life that you promised. I receive it from you, Jesus. I also ask you to baptize me with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, I receive you into my life. I just ask you to give me all your gifts you know I need. I receive it from you and ask you to help me live this day forth the way God desires. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, if you prayed that this morning to to be born again, to accept Jesus for the first time, let me know before you leave. Those of you watching, if you prayed that, please send me an email. Just use the contact us form at the website. I'd sure like to uh, know that you prayed that, to be born again, and then I definitely will be praying for you. Well, praise God. Hallelujah. By Jesus' stripes, we were healed. We were healed. Just declare that over yourself. I don't know what you may or may not be battling, but by Jesus' stripes, you were healed. You were healed. And sometimes the body doesn't want to be in agreement with that. Sometimes the emotions don't want to be in agreement with that. But that is the truth of God. By Jesus' stripes, we were healed. We were healed. We were healed. And Father, I thank you right now for those who are here in this room and those watching who are battling a physical affliction of any kind I thank you that your healing power is ministering to their bodies this very moment. And I thank you that by Jesus' stripes, they were healed. So, Father, 
by faith in your promise, I call this healing manifested in their bodies. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Okay, you guys have a blessed remainder of this afternoon. and Just let God prepare your heart and mind for what he wants to do in the service tonight. If there's anything else that you would like prayer for, just let me know before you leave. Pray for me. We'll see you this evening. Hallelujah.